Praise God. So thankful that you've joined us for our focus on God. And we're going to be looking at, in this message, the paradise of God. You know, many times when we get into Bible prophecy, we stop with the second coming of Jesus Christ. And that's okay. That's okay. The second coming of Jesus Christ is, is beautiful. But today we want to go to the end of the book. We want to go to the end of the story because the end of the story is so powerful. The end of the story takes us back to the beginning, if you will. In Revelation chapter 21, we find ourselves returned to where God first put us, in the paradise of God. And we're going to be focusing on that for the next 50 minutes, the paradise of God. My name is Pastor James Rafferty, and I'm so thankful that you've joined us. Every meeting has been powerful, and God is bringing us back to Himself and His Word. We want to just pause for a moment and just ask God's Holy Spirit to be with us now as we... Uh, get into this message because I believe that the Holy Spirit is going to speak to us, convict us, direct us. So let's pray. Father in heaven, I want to thank you again right now for this opportunity to open your word. I want to thank you for each listener. I want to pray that you will speak to us through this word, through your Bible, that it will touch our hearts perhaps as it never has before, that you will show us in a sense the end of the story that brings us back to the very beginning to the paradise of God, to the place where we were meant to be, with no pain, no suffering, with no death, no sorrow. Father, help us to get a picture, a vision of what you have for us that will motivate us. Speak to each one of our hearts, Father, through your Holy Spirit, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Revelation chapter 21 is where we're going to be beginning, be beginning our message today. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 1 John sees a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth have passed away. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 1. Have you ever imagined, have you ever wondered what the new heaven and the new earth is actually going to look like? Not long ago, I looked it up. Um, an article, a magazine article, that was describing this indoor beach. It was called Sea Gaia. It was an indoor ocean beach that could hold 10,000 people at one time. And this beach was located in the country of Japan. The title of the article was, Welcome to the Great Indoors. This beach was amazing. It had chirping birds that sounded. It had plastic trees that were waving. It had a piped in breeze. It had an artificial volcano that would go off every once in a while. It had vacuum pumps that created surfable waves. This beach had water that was clean and it was actually salt free. And the roof was retractable. In other words, if it was a nice day outside, you could pull the roof back and get real sunshine. But if it wasn't, you could pull the roof over and you'd still enjoy the beauty that was artificially developed here in the Sea Gaia complex. This uh, Sea Gaia complex also had temperature that was controlled. So you could get to the perfect temperature, not too hot, not too cold. They said that this was as close to the original as possible, if not better. Hmm. Now, if sitting half naked on a beach is not your idea of paradise, what about this? Saw spring, summer, autumn, winter snow. Again, this is found in the country of Japan. An indoor ski slope with 600 feet of indoor slopes that were groomed with fresh powder every night. Is this what paradise is going to be like? This perfect beach with salt-free water and, and piped-in breeze and, and, and these uh, uh, surfable waves or the indoor ski slope with fresh powder every night where you can ski to your heart's content. The Bible tells us actually what paradise is going to be like. The Bible says that in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9, it says that as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. It's, it's far beyond that indoor beach with, with, with salt-free water and temperature controlled and a retractable roof. It's, it's, it's beyond anything we can imagine. It's, it's much more than that indoor ski slope groomed with fresh powder every night. What God has prepared for us hasn't even entered into the heart of man. We can't even imagine what God has for us. We can't even imagine what God has at the end of the chapter, the end of the book. But I want you to notice 
the next verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. Because often when we read 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, we don't read it in its context and we leave out this final verse. Notice what it says, but, it starts with a but. Even though the, the eye hasn't seen it, even though the mind hasn't imagined it, even though it hasn't even entered the heart of man, what God has prepared for us, but, but, it says, God has revealed them unto us through His Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. The Holy Spirit has actually revealed to us what paradise is going to be like, and it's going to be powerful, it's going to be beautiful, because God has ordained that we would experience something that goes beyond anything we can think or imagine. And God has revealed that to us in His Word through the Holy Spirit, because we're told the Holy Spirit is the author of the Word of God, the inspiration behind the Word of God, that in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, it says that prophets spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So even though man has imagined it, man can't see it and understand it, God has revealed it to us through His Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is also the author of the Word of God. We're told then that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So there's a connection here between God's Word that is inspired by the Holy Spirit and the development of faith. Our faith is something that we have to manifest toward things we don't necessarily see. We're told in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. In other words, Faith is something that we manifest even though we don't see it, even though we haven't imagined it. So put these things together now. What God is actually saying to us is that God has something for us in paradise that we can't imagine, we can't understand, but the Holy Spirit reveals it to us and that Holy Spirit is the inspiration of the Word of God and the Word of God reveals these things to us by faith. In other words, this is, there's total harmony between what we're reading here in Romans chapter 10, verse 7, and, and Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, and 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. There's total harmony here. Man hasn't seen it. Man hasn't comprehended it. We can't even imagine it. But the Holy Spirit has revealed it to us through His Word, and that develops faith, which is the evidence of things hoped for, the substance of things not seen. Follow this because it's so beautiful. It's so powerful. God has so much for us that He wants us to understand when we study this subject. So by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by God. Right? The Word of God spoke and the words, worlds were framed. We believe that by faith. We weren't there. We didn't see it. But we believe it by faith because we read the Word of God and the Word of God develops this faith, this belief in us. Well, God's Word is going to do the same thing for us as we study the paradise of God. This topic on the paradise of God is going to be so powerful because it's established in the Word of God and it comes to us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and it develops in us faith to look beyond our present world and the things that we see and understand what God really has for us. You know, the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 11, we call that the faith chapter, the great faith chapter. The Bible tells us that it was by faith that Moses, when he became of age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasure, uh, passing pleasures of sin. That's Hebrews chapter 11 and verses 24 and 25. This is amazing when you think about it. Moses was Pharaoh. He was the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He could have anything he wanted power, wealth, position, all of it was his. And yet he chose to be connected with God's people, with the Hebrews, who were at that time, they were in bondage. They were in sin. Moses chose to suffer with the people of God, to suffer affliction with the people of God, than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Moses did this by faith. What was it that caused Moses to, to make this decision? What was it that caused him to actually suffer affliction? Because, you know, as Christians, many of us are seen in the, in the Bible, in the books of, of, of prophecy, we're seeing a crisis that's coming to us. We're seeing perhaps a time, we're told in Revelation chapter 13, it's, it, perhaps it might be right upon us, but we know for sure it's coming. We're told in Revelation 13, there's a time coming when God's people will not be able to buy or sell unless they receive this mark of the beast, that God's people are going to be afflicted and their lives are going to be threatened. Well, Moses chose to suffer affliction with the people of God. He chose to become part of those, the, of those who were his bondmen. He chose when he could have had all the riches and the wealth of Egypt, he chose to suffer with his people. 
He chose something that was unusual, but he chose it through faith. He chose it through exercising faith. And what was it that motivated Moses to exercise this faith? Well, we're told further in Hebrews that he esteemed the reproaches of Christ. That's the persecution that came to him because of uh, aligning himself with the Hebrews. He, cho- he esteemed those reproaches greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. Why? Because he had respect under the recompense of the reward. That's Hebrews 11 verse 26. That's the, the King James Version. You know, there's, there's other translations that kind of bring this out a little bit. One of them says in the New King James that he looked to the reward. He was looking forward to the reward. He, he had his eyes off earthly things and he was looking forward to the reward. The NIV says he was looking ahead to his reward. He kept his eyes ahead to the reward. You know, we do that to a degree. As people on planet Earth, you know, many times we put in our uh, study time because we want to get our degree, we want to graduate from high school or college. Uh, we put in our hours because, you know, we want, to, we want to get our money, our paycheck. We're looking ahead to that payday. Uh, we put in our years because we want to retire. We're looking forward to retirement, you know. And all of those things are, are earthly. They're okay. But, but God has something far beyond anything this earth has to offer us. Remember, I hasn't seen, Right. It hasn't even entered into the imagination of the heart of man what God has prepared for us. So Moses understood this, and he was looking ahead to his reward. Can you imagine what, if, what it would have been like if Moses wouldn't have looked ahead to his reward? Now, he could have chosen to be fair on Egypt. He could have chosen to be a prince in Egypt. But where would he be right now if Moses had focused on earthly things? Well, I imagine Moses would be in a museum. You know, he would have been mummified. He would have been a pharaoh, a leader. He would have mummified. And of course, all of his stuff would have been dug up at one point or another and probably put in the museum just like Tutankhamun, you know. And, and we'd be going there and we'd be paying all these big bucks to go see all Moses' stuff. And we'd say, wow, look at that. Look at that golden chariot that Moses had. Man, Moses must have had a good life. Moses must have had a really great time when he was enjoying the pleasures of sin for a season. You know, uh, Psalm 16 verse 11 tells us that at God's right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. And that's the difference. And Moses knew this. The difference between this world and God's paradise is that this world's pleasures are temporary. That's the problem with sin. Sin has a consequence that ends pleasure. God's pleasure continues forever. And Moses got his focus on this. So where is Moses right now? He's not in a, a museum. With all his stuff, Moses made the choice to turn away from the pleasures of of this world, the pleasures of sin for a season. And Moses is now, according to Jude, verse 9, Moses is in heaven. Moses is in heaven with God, enjoying pleasures forevermore at his right hand. Let me ask you a question, friends. Do you think Moses made a good decision? Yes, I think so. And that's what God wants us to do right now, today. He wants us to make a good decision for him. You know, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11 tells us, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. God wants us with Moses to look ahead to the future and the hope that he has for us. He wants us to get our eyes off the things of this world that are just temporary. Even the pleasures of this world, they're just for a season. They're just seasonal. And he wants us to think about the end of the book, to think about where we're headed, where God wants to return us. It's not just to the second coming of Jesus. No, it's beyond that. He wants to return us to paradise. Remember the thief on the cross, he told them, Jesus told them, I tell you verily, verily, I say unto you today, you will be with me in paradise. You will be with me in paradise. So what is paradise? What does it look like? Remember, the Holy Spirit has inspired us to understand a little bit about this. All we need to do is go back to the beginning because in the beginning we were in paradise. We were created in paradise. God in the beginning saw everything he had made and it was, Genesis 131, it was very good. It was, it was beautiful pure, fresh air with these fluffy uh, clouds and this beautiful blue sky, not the the polluted miasma that, that we see in our world today. God created us in the beginning to, to enjoy His creation that was untainted with pollution. God wanted us to enjoy the myriads of colors and the flowers and, and the trees, the green and the red and the yellow and the purple and the scarlet. 
not all of the polluted concrete jungles that, that surround us in our world today. God originally created us to enjoy the, the fish of different sizes and shapes and the animals and all that he had created for us, not the polluted waters that we see in our world today. God originally formed us to enjoy this world. He created it in a way that would bring all of the pleasures of life. It was a paradise. It was a paradise. So what happened? Well, John chapter 10, verse 10 tells us that a thief came and the thief came only to steal and to kill and to destroy. And that thief, of course, was Lucifer, the fallen angel, Satan, the devil. He has sought to undermine God's creation, to lead us into rebellion and to lose everything that God created us to experience. But guess what? That's not the rest of the verse. John chapter 10, verse 10 brings us to the rest of the story. Even though this thief came to kill and steal and destroy, Jesus says, but I have come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. Praise God. God has sent his son to redeem us. And that redemption is real. That redemption is biblical. And that redemption is what God wants for each one of us. You see, sin is just an interruption to God's plan. It's a temporary interruption to what God originally purposed for humanity. Sin has interrupted God's plan because sin has turned us away from God's original paradise. But God has promised restoration. God is going to restore us. What does this restoration look like? Well, this restoration that God has promised, the salvation from sin comes in three parts. It's salvation from sin's guilt, and that is justification. It's salvation from sin's power, and that is sanctification. And it's salvation from sin's consequences, sin's effect, and that is glorification. And you can read about those three aspects of salvation in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30. It's the last one we're going to focus on right now. We're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, one of my favorite voice, verses, verse 26, the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. A lot of times we ask the question when we lose loved ones, even when we lose our, our pets, our, our beloved pets, animals, friends, family, those that are close to us, we ask the question, why did God allow people to die? Why did God allow death? Well, God didn't actually bring death. Death is an enemy of God. God has allowed it because God is love and, and love uh, necessitates freedom to choose. And we've chosen death. We've chosen death because we've chosen sin. And the wages of sin is death. That's our choice. And God has been a gentleman. He's given us the freedom to choose. But a day is coming when he's going to end all of this. A day is coming when he's going to destroy sin. And the last enemy that God is going to destroy is death. Praise God. There's going to be, therefore, a resurrection from the grave for those who believe in Jesus Christ. We're told in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with a trumpet of God and the dead in Christ are going to rise first. Then they, we who are alive, we who remain, we who are, are, are present when Jesus comes and haven't tasted, we who are alive are going to be caught up together with them and we're going to meet the Lord in the air and thus will we always be with the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. That's powerful. And of course, this is a truth that's found all through the scriptures. But John focuses on it in the book of Revelation under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. John talks about this first resurrection that's going to take place at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And then there's this thousand year millennium, this thousand years where the earth is just left desolate. That's described in, in the Old Testament book of Jeremiah and Isaiah, as well as in the book of Revelation, a thousand years where we go to heaven, the righteous go to heaven, those who are part of the first resurrection go to heaven, and they there investigate the whole great controversy, the whole several thousand years, 6,000 plus years of this great controversy between sin and righteousness, between God and the devil. And all the questions are answered. And then there's a judgment that takes place during that time, a judgment that takes place in relationship to the wicked. And then after the thousand years, we're told that there's going to be a second resurrection, a resurrection of damnation. And in that resurrection, we're going to see the holy city descend down to this earth. The new Jerusalem city is going to come to planet earth. John saw this. He saw the second coming of Christ. And then he saw this thousand year period. And then he saw the new Jerusalem city coming down to this earth and settling in this earth because this earth is going to become the center of God's universe. 
This is the place where God is going to dwell. John saw all of this in the book of Revelation. You know, many times we study the book of Revelation and we go through, you know, the first parts and the second parts and the third parts. And we, we get to the place where the crisis hits, you know, on the mark of the beast. And we, we know all of the history. We know what's going to, what's happening now. We know what's coming with the mark of the beast. And then we stop at the second coming of Jesus and we don't finish the book. We don't finish the story. God wants to take us to the rest of the story. He wants us to understand that he's restoring us to the paradise of God. And we've got to get our focus there. When Moses got his focus on his reward, when he got his focus on the paradise of God, he was okay with suffering with his people for a little while on planet Earth. He was okay with discarding the pleasure of sin for a season. He was motivated and we need to be motivated. And our motivation is going to come when God's love reveals to us this restoration that he has for us. The, the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the everlasting gospel of Revelation chapter 14, 6 and 7 takes us all the way back to where we came from, all the way back to paradise restored. John saw this in Revelation chapter 21. In verse two, John says, then I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven uh, as a, as from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And he goes on to say this. He says, and I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them. Praise God. God is going to dwell with us. He's going to be with us. He is going to be one with us. The holy city is going to come down from heaven to this earth and God is going to actually tabernacle with us because that was his ideal in the first place. God would come to us and tabernacle with us in the garden. That's, that's how it all started. And it says there, continuing on in Revelation chapter 21, remember, this is the rest of the story, right? This is the part we don't always look at. This is the part we leave off. It says there that God is going to wipe away every tear from our eyes. There's going to be no more uh, death and there's going to be no more sorrow and there's going to be no more crying, right? Because there's going to be no more pain. The former things are going to be passed away. And that's what we want to focus on. You know, right now, life is a pain especially as you're getting older. It's difficult, you know? We get back pain, we get leg pain, we get hip pain that makes us want to complain, right? But someday soon, all of that is going away. All of that is going away because God is going to restore us to the health, the vitality, to that love and that happiness and joy that He created us to experience. In fact, this world is just an opportunity for us to know, to taste a little bit of what God has for us, what God has for us. God wants us to taste heaven. And, and this is the way it works. If you've ever in your life had one opportunity, even if it was just for a few seconds or a few minutes or a few hours or maybe for, for a very long time, if you've ever in your life had an opportunity to experience pure joy, maybe it was when you got married, maybe it was when you went on that vacation, maybe it was when you got that raise or you got that you know, diploma or that, or that job or, or maybe it was when you, you, you know, got that little toy that you really wanted, whatever it was, accepting Christ as your Savior, that's one of the highlights of my life. The joy that you feel, the freedom that you feel from guilt, the, the experience, the, the exhilaration that you feel in that moment. Think about that never ending. Think about that joy being permanent forever and you have just tasted heaven. You have just tasted paradise because God wants us to experience joy forever more unending. This is what we see in the book of Revelation and it's powerful really if you think about it. This is the picture that is not only given us in the back of Revelation, but it's given us all through the Bible. If we go to the Old Testament, we're going to find all of these paradise promises. For example, Isaiah chapter 33, verse 24 says, And the inhabitants shall not say, I am sick. Sorry, physicians, you're out of a job in heaven. You're no longer needed. Praise the Lord, you can play golf all the time. No more sickness in heaven. What else? We read in Isaiah chapter 35, verse 5, it says, And then the eyes of the blind shall be opened. Optometrist, you're out of a job also. There's no more glasses, no more contacts. There's no more LASIK surgery in heaven. Everyone's going to see 100%. And then it says in Isaiah 35, verse 5, The ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Hearing aids, thing of the past. No more. Uh, could you repeat that? I didn't quite hear it, right? We're going to have perfect ears hearing, we're going to have perfect seeing, we're going to have perfect health in heaven, we're going to, the lame will leap like a deer, there's not going to be any more wheelchairs, any more crutches, any more walking sticks, all of us are going to be able to leap like the deer. You know, we lived in the country, we've lived in the country for years, and when you live in the country, you have to build a deer fence. 
And I remember we were living up in, in uh, up near the Canadian border. And we had this seven foot deer fence around our place. We had about five acres with this big deer fence around it. We had a, about a hundred uh, fruit trees and we had a garden, you know, and those deer, they like to come in and they like to eat your fruit. They like to eat your garden. And so we'd have a, a gate that we close every night. And I remember one night I forgot to close the gate. And as I walked out of the house that morning and I looked down the driveway, there was a deer, a buck. This deer had the antlers and this deer was big. And I thought, how am I going to get him out of here? Because sometimes a deer with antlers, they'll run into the fence and they'll get caught in there and they won't be able to get out. And so I started carefully walking toward him so as not to scare him, hoping to lead him back out the gate that he had come in. And as I started walking toward him, he saw me, he got really scared. He turned around and he started running, not toward the gate because the driveway curved just a little bit. He started running directly toward that fence. And I thought, oh no, this is going to be terrible. And as he got right up close to that fence, he leapt up into the air and he went right over my deer fence, right over the top of that seven foot deer fence. It was a beautiful sight to see. That's what it's going to be for us in the new heavens and in the new earth. We're told that, that the tongue of the dumb will sing. In other words, there's going to be no more uh, deaf and dumb people there. We are going to be able to sing. And, I, and I'm looking forward to it from this perspective, that I want to be able to sing like John Loma King. I want to be able to sing like Tim Parton. I want to be able to sing like the best of them. I want to be a, a, a singer in Israel uh, like my, my brother Ryan Day. I want to be able to have a voice because right now I can't really carry a tune. Don't tell anyone that. That's a secret between me and you. But in heaven, we're going to be able to praise God for all eternity. In fact, it says that in heaven, the wilderness will, will and the wasteland shall be glad for them, that the desert will rejoice, rejoice and blossom as the rose. In, in other words, all the land, there's going to be no desert. There's going to be no desolate places. All of the land is going to be usable. All the land is going to blossom. There's not going to be these, these vast barren places, you know, where, where you drive through and you just see nothing. God is going to actually bring the land back to the, to the Edenic beautif, beauty uh, in which he established it. It's going to be beautiful. And then it goes on to say this, and this is really interesting. It talks in, in Isaiah, it talks about the fact that, that uh, in Isaiah eleven eight 8, that the nursing child is going to be able to play by a cobra's hole, you know, a cobra, a venomous snake. The nursing child is going to be able to play by the cobra's hole. And it says there, the weaned child is going to be able to put his hand into a viper's den. You know, there's one thing that I don't like, and it's snakes or anything poisonous. I mean, it just kind of unnerves me, right? But in heaven, it says, we're not going to be fearing, fearful for poisonous snakes or animals of any kind because we're told that they're not going to hurt or destroy in all my holy mountains, says the Lord. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 9. There's not going to be any more pain, any more fear of these animals in the heavens made new. When my son was young, he's almost 30 years old right now, when he was young, he colored in this uh, picture of paradise, this picture of the new heavens and the new earth. And, and that's his lion pet right there. He's on the rope swing right there. You see him swinging across, and that's his pet lion right there. You know, there's going to, the knowledge of the, of, the, of the Lord is going to fill the earth like the waters cover the sea, and there's not going to be any more pain. There's not going to be any more sorrow. There's not going to be any more fear. There's not going to be any more uh, fear of animals. We are going to sit down, the Bible says, we're going to, the lamb is going to sit down with the lion. They're going to, and the fatling together, they're going to play together. And this is a real picture. This is a picture of a lioness by the name of Little Tyke. Now, if you've never read the story of Little Tyke, do a little research. Try to find the story. The, the books are still available. They've been reprinted. Little Tyke was a lioness that lived in Washington State back in the 50s and 60s. And Little Tyke was a lioness that would travel from place to place to show people God's uh, God's glory, God's paradise, what God wanted for us. And as Little Tyke would go to these, little, these, these uh, venues... A lot of people would come and they'd want to would look at Little Tyke and they'd want to go up and pet Little Tyke. They took a picture one time of a little girl in a little cart um, with Little Tyke pulling her. And, and the Bible verse, you know, a little child shall lead them. That was That's a promise that we have in Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 6. This was realized in the story of Little Tyke. 
Little Tyke was a lioness who would actually pull little children in these carts, let, let the, the lioness would lead these little children. She would sit down with uh, sheep and with lambs and she wouldn't eat them, she wouldn't harm them. Uh, but, but a time came when the owners began to worry about Little Tyke. They began to worry about the fact that she wouldn't eat meat. She was actually a vegetarian lioness. Now, the Bible tells us in Isaiah that the lion will eat straw like the ox. And God tells us in Genesis that uh, his animals, all of them, were created vegetarian. But these people didn't know that at the time. And, and science told them, people were concerned. Science told them, listen, you need to get little tyke to eat some, some, some meat because vegetarian lionesses aren't going to live very long. This, we're worried about little tyke. We're worried that she's not going to live long. And so you know what they did? They offered a thousand dollars for anyone who could get little tyke to eat meat and you know a lot of people came and they had these little mixtures that they did you know and it was they tried to disguise the meat etc and then finally they were getting i mean it, exasperated because no one could get little tyke to eat meat and they were worried about her finally a young man came and this young man says don't you don't you read your bible don't you know that, that, that God made them vegetarian in the beginning and, and they went back and they read Genesis chapter one and sure enough, from that day on, they were at peace. But they could have asked little tyke. They could have said, hey, little tyke, aren't you going to eat some of this meat? And little tyke would say, no, thanks. I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> you know, I was doing meetings with a good friend of mine. He's now passed to rest. He's resting in the Lord. His name was Ezekiel Zarosh. Ezekiel Zarosh was a Pentecostal pastor in Pakistan. And I was there several times and he would always want me to come and preach at his churches. The reason why we connected was because Ezekiel was a Pentecostal pastor who knew his Bible better than any Seventh-day Adventist pastor over there. And in Pakistan, all the churches, all the Christian churches kind of come together. So when I went over there to do meetings, all the Christian churches came to the meetings because we were Christians, right? And Ezekiel Zarosh was my translator because he was the best translator because he knew his Bible so well. And so Ezekiel would translate all of the meetings that we would do over there, all the evangelistic meetings we would do over there. And at, he would always ask me to come and preach at one of his churches. And so when he went through the series, he really liked this message on the paradise of God. And so he would ask me, whenever I went over there, he had 120 churches under him. Whenever I went over there, he would have me preach at another church. And he would say, James, I want you to preach on the paradise of God. I said, but I already preached on that. He said, no, I want you to preach on the paradise of God. In this church, you've never preached in this church on the paradise of God. I want my members to hear this message on the paradise of God. And so I would preach that message on the paradise of God. And I would come to this section you know, about Little Tyke and, and talk about how they offered $1,000 for anyone who get Little Tyke to eat meat, you know, and how we're not going to be fair to the animals because they're not going to want to eat us in heaven, you know, because God made them originally be vegetarians. And when we return to paradise, we're going to return to God's original purpose. And so I said, I'm just preparing ahead of time by being a vegetarian now. I'm just preparing ahead of time for paradise. And one evening we went to this, this grand feast. It was 11 o'clock at night. I can't eat usually that late, but I was told, hey, they're doing this for you. It was an outdoor event. The host, uh, uh, the owner of the place, you know, was serving me and they had this long table. We all sat there. They had me sitting at the head of the table and Ezekiel was next to me and the conference president was to my left and they had all this all this food in front of me and right my immediate presence right the food right in front of me oh with a chicken dish and a fish dish and just these meat dishes you know and and we had prayer and Ezekiel said to me you know go ahead go ahead and eat and of course I was in a position where I was afraid to offend and I said to Ezekiel I said but but you know I'm a vegetarian and Ezekiel smiled and he said I would give a thousand dollars for anyone that could get James to eat meat. And then the host went to the end of the table and bought the, brought the vegetarian dishes down to the other end of the table where I was sitting. It was a little bit of a test, but it was so funny to think that Ezekiel had referred to little type and this message of God's paradise restored. So Ezekiel Zerosh is resting in the Lord right now. He's going to rest for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And someday when that trump sounds, we're going to meet in the air and we're going to reminisce on all those old times together. So little Tyke would travel from place to place. And one time he came to this place where there were a lot of children and a, and a young kid ran up to little Tyke and threw himself down in front of little Tyke. And, and he looked into little Tyke's eyes and little Tyke was looking into his eyes. And he said to little Tyke, he said, I'd rather have you than a dog. 
And then uh, as they were listening there, the people around them were listening there, the boy got a little bit closer to little Tyke, a little bit closer to his, his nose, and, and little Tyke was intently looking at him. And, and, and then he said, little Tyke, I'd rather have you than a dozen dogs. And then, as the story goes, the little boy put his nose right up to little Tyke's nose, nose to nose, eye to eye, and little boy said, little Tyke, I'd rather have you than a million dogs. We were made to connect with the animals. Now, sin has caused separation, but God wants to restore us back to that connectivity. He wants to restore us back to the animals that were created for our pleasure. And we see, at times, we see pictures of this in our world today. These pictures are of, of a gamekeeper in Africa who feeds these animals, these lions and these tigers and, and other animals. He feeds them and he's become their friend. And he hangs out with them and he, he rubs their bellies and, and he, he wrestles with them and, and he enjoys their company. They nuzzle together and, and at times, you know, he's, he's grabbing them from behind and, and they're completely tame. They do him no harm whatsoever. There are times when he, he gets in the water with them. He enjoys, you know, uh, even uh, the, the, the scariest of animals. <laughs> he enjoys cuddling with them. Animals that we would think, oh, I don't want to be even close to that. And God has restored him to the paradise of God in a sense because he's restored him, he's reconnected him with these animals that we were supposed to be connected with from the very beginning. Isn't it going to be amazing? I can't wait to give a bear a genuine bear hug. I can't wait to be reconnected with all of God's creation without any kind of fear of being eaten or consumed. I can't wait till the leopard doesn't chase uh, its prey to eat it, but it chases its prey simply to say, hey, how are you doing? It's good to see you. When the leopard licks the neck of its prey instead of chewing the neck of its prey, and its prey returns the favor. I can't wait until we are restored to the paradise of God. The Bible tells us, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. Isaiah 11 in verse 9. Have you ever thought about this? God's holy mountain, you know, Daniel chapter 12, verse 3, the very last verse, prophetic verse in the book of Daniel before Daniel is given instruction as to what to do with his book in verses 4 through 13 of Daniel 12. The very last prophetic verse says, They that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Have you ever thought about that? Forever and ever. You know, sometimes living on this earth causes us to feel like we don't want to live forever and ever because there's so much pain and sorrow and crying, but all that's gonna be done away. And we are actually gonna live forever and ever. You know, I'm almost three score years old. That's 60 years old. I was born in 1962, but one day I'm going to be 1,060 years old. And then I'm going to be 1 million and 60 years old. And then I'm going to be 1 billion and 60 years old. And then I'm gonna be 1 trillion and 60 years old. And then I'm gonna be 1 quadrillion and 60 years old. And by the time I'm a quadrillion and 60 years old, and, and you, maybe you're a quadrillion 20 years old, you know, we're going to be about the same age. I mean, you know, what's a couple decades when you're a quadrillion years old? But then it doesn't stop there. I'm going to be one quintillion and 60 years old. And then I'm going to be one sextillion and 60 years old. And then I'm going to be one septillion and 60 years old. You know what comes after a septillion? Then I'm going to be one octillion and 60 years old. And then I'm going to be one no million and 60 years old. And there's more. I'm going to then be one decillion and 60 years old. And after a decillion and 60 years of age, there comes the number Googleplex. <laughs> it's the largest number that we know. And I guess it's called Googleplex because this number Googles the brain. Someday I'm going to be a Googleplex and 60 years old. And when I get to be a Googleplex and 60 years old, eternity will just be beginning. Soon, very soon, I'm going to be eternity and 60 years old. Can you imagine being eternity and 60 years old? God wants us to imagine this. 
God wants us to get our minds and our hearts on this. He wants us to look forward to what He has for us. He wants us to look forward to our reward. And this is why the Bible tells us in James chapter 4, verse 14, what is your life on this earth? What is your life? Is it isn't it even a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away? I love the way that the NIV translate this. It says, you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Let me illustrate it this way, right? Here's a spray bottle. Here's a mist. That's your life. Now you see it and now you don't. You're a mist. You're a vapor. There's me, there's my wife, there's my kids. They're a little younger than me, but so, so me and my wife started first and my kids came after us, but we're all just a vapor. We were born, we go to school, we graduate, we get a job, we get married, we do whatever. And by the time we're ready to retire, it's like it was nothing. It seems like just yesterday that I was a young man. My life is a vapor. Your life is a vapor. It's vapor life. The Bible is trying to clarify for us the difference between the life we have now and eternity. Our life right now is just a vapor. It's just a temporary intervention between our creation, the paradise that we were created to experience, and paradise restored. It's just a temporary pause, an interruption in God's plan. And that's why we're told in Bible prophecy, 2 Peter chapter 3, specifically verse 8, that there's something we should not fail to forget. It says, my, but beloved, and this is in the context of people who are, who are naysaying the second coming, oh, ever since the fathers fell asleep, all oh, things continue as they were. Yeah, we've heard the promises. We've heard all of this stuff. You know. And Peter responds and he says, whenever you think about how long it seems before the second coming of Jesus, how long it seems to have taken for Jesus to return to fulfill his promises, you know, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'm coming again. I'm coming again. I'm returning because I want you to be with me where I am. When you s hear people naysaying that and, well, you know, I, my parents believe that and my grandparents believe that and I never even thought I would get in through college and here we are, we're still here. When you hear that, Peter says, you need to remember one thing. Don't be ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. What does that mean? Let's just break it down. You know, we talk about Pacific Standard Time and we talk about Mountain Standard Time. And we talk about Central Standard Time. And we talk about Eastern Standard Time. Well, the Bible has what we would call Eternal Standard Time. Eternal Standard Time. Here's how it works, right? Eternal Standard Time is 1,000 years equals one day. In eternity, when we think of eternity, when we think about living forever past Googleplex, when we think about eternity, 1,000 years is like a day, 2 Peter 3, 8, right? That's eternal standard time, okay? So a thousand years in eternal time is like a day in earthly time. So when we're thinking about earthly time, all oh, the years drag by. We think about eternal time, there's a big difference because you're living for eternity. A thousand years can go by, it's like a day. All right, let's bring this now into the, the, the equation that we have in the Bible because in Revelation, we're told over and over again, behold, I come quickly, Blessed is he that keeps the words of this prophecy of this book, Revelation chapter 22, verse 7. Again, Revelation chapter 22, verse 12. And remember, this is the end of the book. This is at the last chapter. This is where we need to land. We don't land at the second coming. We don't land at the mark of the beast. Many times we land in the crisis. We land in the crisis time. We want to get beyond the crisis time. We want to look forward to our reward. Behold, I'm coming quickly. My reward is with me to get every man according to his work. Sometimes we think, oh, he's coming quickly. What are we going to do? I'm, we're not going to be ready. No, no. He's trying to tell us about this eternal standard time equation. He's trying to help us to understand this, right? And again, he says, which is three times in this one chapter, verse 20, again, Revelation 22, he that testifies these things says, surely I come quickly, even so come Lord Jesus. Let's look at this. If we think about eternal standard time, right? If we think about a day equals a thousand years, 2 Peter 3, 8, then in earthly standard time, Jesus has been gone for 2,000 years, but in eternal standard time, Jesus has been gone for two days. Jesus is saying to us, I'll be back in two days. Keep your focus in heaven. Keep your focus on eternal standard time. Recognize that in the context of eternity, a thousand years is like a day. In the context of living forever, a thousand years is like a day. I'll be back in two days. Keep your focus in heavenly places. I'll be back in two days. 1,000 years in heavenly time represents 24 hours. So if 1,000 years represents 24 hours, 
then what does 100 years represent? I mean, if we were able to live 100 years, and some people are living 100 years right now, I know my, my grandfather-in-law did, and, and my father-in-law is pushing 100. Uh, if we were able to live 100 years, you know, we drink all of our soy milk, and we eat all of our veggie dogs, and we just were healthy, okay, scratch veggie dogs, but we, we eat healthfully, you know, we eat plant-based, and we could live for 100 years in earthly time. That's a long time. But what would that come out to in heavenly time, in eternal time? That would be two point four hours or two hours and 24 minutes in the context of eternity living for a hundred years on planet earth is like living two hours and 24 minutes see this is what Moses was calculating in his brain he's like I could live for two hours and 24 minutes as a pharaoh or I could live for all eternity with God hmm boy shouldn't take me long to figure that one out right and it didn't take Moses long to figure that one out. He said, you know what? I'm going to trade in my 2.24. I'm going to trade in my 2 hours and 24 minutes for eternity. And that's really what, what, what this time on earth is about. This time on earth is about the choice that God wants us to make. Now, I don't have 2 hours and 24. I probably have just... 24 minutes left. I mean, I don't have the whole two hours, but some of you listening, you're young and you have your two hours and 24 minutes or your two hours and, or your two hours, right? And, and are you saying to God, you know what? I want to hold on to my two hours. I want to keep my two. I want to live my life the way I, I don't want God telling me how to live my life. I want to live my life. That's from the devil. The devil came to Jesus in the wilderness. And he said, I'll give you the whole world. If you come down and worship me, just bow down and worship me. And Jesus says, what? In, no way am I doing that. Because Jesus had his mind on eternal things. And God wants to get our minds on eternal things. And that's why he tells us, don't trade your 2.4 for eternity. Don't hold on to your 2.4. Excuse me, don't hold on to your 2.4 and turn away from eternity. Trade in your 2.4 for eternity. You know what a trade in is. You know, it's when you take something that you have, maybe it's used and it's, maybe it's abused and you trade it and you get good stuff for it. Can you imagine if you take your used car into a car dealer and they give you a brand new vehicle and they just want your used car? They give you a brand new vehicle. It's all paid for. Jesus wants to give us eternity for our measly 2.4, our painful, sorrowful 2.4. Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 8 and verse 18. He says, I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed in us. It's not even worthy to be compared. When we think about what God has for us, when we think about his love for us, when we think about the restoration that God is gifting to us in Jesus Christ, it's not even worthy to be compared with the suffering of this world, with the pain of this world. 2.4 hours, pain, suffering. Yes, it's difficult, but when we meet those moments of joy, it reminds us of what God has for us for all eternity, of the, of the value of eternal life that's gifted to us through the love of God in Jesus Christ. Oh, friends, we need to be willing to consider this reward, to consider this eternity, consider this love, to consider the heart of God toward us because if one of us is missing in heaven, there'll be an empty spot in the heart of God throughout all eternity. Now, as we close this up, we want to think about just one thing that's even greater than anything we've talked about so far. And that's the idea in Revelation that someday we're going to see the face of God. We're going to see the face of Jesus. That's what we're told in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 4. We're told that we're going to see the face of Jesus. It says, and they shall see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Okay, so... What's it going to be like when we see the face of Jesus? What, what is his face going to look like? I know we're going to say, well, that's what you look like. Wow, you've got that, you know, beautiful Mediterranean, Mediterranean complexion. And well, actually, Revelation chapter 1 tells us a lot of what Jesus looks like. It says that he has eyes like a flame of fire. And it says he has feet like polished brass. You know, I love to go camping. And when I go camping, there's nothing better than sitting around a campfire in the evening and just looking in to those to that fire. It just, it's mesmerizing. It's so peaceful. And, and to listen to that water out there on the lake, listen to that water running. And, and it says that the, the eyes of Christ are like lamps of fire and, and his voice is like the voice of many waters. It's attractive. And we're going to see the face of Jesus and we're going to see that, that he loves us. And as we see the face of Jesus, I believe he's going to give us a hug. He's going to come to us and he's going to wrap his arms around us. Each one of us individually are going to be embraced by Jesus Christ. And as he does this, he's going to whisper in our ear. 
He's going to be holding on to us. You know how you hugs people sometimes and you get the feeling they don't want to let go? I don't know. You have that precious moment, that special moment where you're just holding on. You know, you're sharing a moment. There's something between you and you're just holding on. We're going to have this moment with Jesus where he's just going to hold us. He's going to wrap his arms around us and he's not wanting, going to want to let go of us. You know, we're going to kind of think, oh, maybe it's time. And Jesus is like, I'm holding on to you. And then he whispers in, in our ear and you know what he says? He says, I am so glad that you chose to be here with me. I'm so glad that you responded to my love. I'm so glad that you are here in heaven. He's going to hold on to us. We think that being in heaven is going to be a joy for us. And sometimes we forget that being in heaven is going to be a joy for Jesus. Isaiah 53 says that he went through all the pain and suffering, not just physical, but mental anguish. He gave his soul over to death because he looked, it says, he would see the, the, the reward and he would be satisfied. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 12, it says that in verse 3, it says that, that he was focused on this reward and that's what caused him to despise the shame. He just despised the shame. There's no shame here because I'm looking at the reward. I'm looking at you. He's looking at us, friends, each one of us. And he knows that all that he's gone through in his life as a human being was well worth it. And he wants us to know that all we have to go, anything we have to go through is going to be well worth it. He wants us to be there more than we want to be there. He wants us to be there. The Father wants us to be there. The Holy Spirit wants us to be there. And he reminds us of this in Bible prophecy. A lot of times we think, oh, Bible prophecy, that's all about, you know, the end of the world and everything's going to end. And, you know, Jesus is going to come and everything's going to be destroyed. Bible prophecy, every single Bible prophecy from Daniel to Revelation, every single cycle, every single uh, cyclical uh, event that's revealed there in the image and the beasts and, and the kings of the north and the kings of the south and the churches and the seals and the trumpets, every one of them, even the vials, all of them end in the paradise of God, right? When you go to Daniel chapter 2, you have these images, these powers, these ten horns, and then you have, you have this great stone that's cut out of the mountain without hands and it hits the image of the feet and it becomes a great mountain and fills the whole earth. That's the paradise of God. In Daniel chapter 7, you have the time when the saints are given the kingdom, when they inherit the kingdom. In, in Daniel chapter 11, you have this, this time when Michael stands up and delivers his people and, and they that shine as the brightness of the stars, they that are righteous will shine the bright, as the brightness of the stars forever, stars forever and ever. In Revelation chapter 7, each church is promised something that points them to paradise. And, and the last church is told, you're going to sit with me on my throne in paradise. In Revelation chapter 7, that's the churches, the seals. It ends in Revelation chapter 7, in verse 17, with God leading us beside the living fountains of waters and wiping away all tears from our eyes. Revelation chapter uh, 11, the, the trumpets ends with God's people Christ establishing his kingdom. In Revelation, of course, chapter 21, we have Jesus Christ and God himself dwelling with us, the New Jerusalem temple coming down and establishing itself on planet earth. And there's only one thing that's left in the prophecies of Revelation when we get to the very end, and that is this invitation. And it's an invitation that I'm extending to you in behalf of heaven right now. This invitation to come, the spirit, the Holy Spirit says come, the bride says come, everything, everything in heaven, all heaven is pouring out. All heaven is saying, come, come, except of the gift of salvation in Jesus Christ. <laughs> 